Coming up next on Twitch this week in computer hardware, building a new gaming PC in time for Bulletstorm. From a netbook to a Core i7 notebook, stop vSync issues, Sandy Bridge Mobo RMAs, and water cooling for newbies. All coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 106, recorded February 10th, 2011. Try AMD. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com slash twitch. And by MailRoute. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. One user, 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. Visit MailRoute.info for more details. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by the man, the myth, the benchmarking legend, Mr. Ryan Shroud of PCPer.com. Where are you, man? Uh, I'm doing fine. You know, apparently I should have been doing more benchmarking this week, I guess, because it was kind of a, a slow week in the world <laughs> of, like, PC hardware. Uh, this, this, I guess, we could mark down as the week no graphics cards were released. Um, <laughs> There's somebody somewhere released a graphics card. It's we noteworthy. haven't looked hard enough. <laughs> we we haven't looked hard enough. There's got to be at least one new GPU out there from some vendor we've never heard of. Maybe it's just the pink version. But <clears throat> I do I do have something um, I, I, we can talk about real quick. This is kind of like a, a I don't know if you can see this here. This this is a uh, this is an old graphics card. This is a 9800 GTX. <laughs> This is this is kind of like a, not just a prop either. Uh, there should be an article going up on PC Perspective probably tomorrow. That you know, one of the things that we get in a lot in, in emails and in in tweets and all that type of stuff into this weekend computer hardware is, is it time to upgrade my system? Is it time to upgrade my computer? And a lot of times they're asking specifically about processors or they're asking about graphics cards. Um, so I took uh, what I consider probably one of the most popular old graphics cards. You could go with the 8800 GT or the 9800 GTX. They're basically um, very, very similar cards uh, performance-wise, feature-wise, all that kind of stuff. DX10 parts, not DX11 parts, obviously. And ran it through some of the benchmarks, same benchmarks that we use today. Metro 2033, Lost Planet 2, Civilization 5, Left 4 Dead 2, uh, those types of games, the, the modern ones. And kind of We'll have an article that compares, well, what do you get from your performance upgrade to a $240 GTX uh, 560 Ti or for $120 more than that, a 6970, or for $120 more than that, a GTX 580. Um, and I think a lot of people will be surprised how much more performance you get and uh, trying the best way to, to visualize this in some kind of article form is... Uh, you know, moving from DX10 to DX11, you get some image quality improvements as well. So even right. though, say, uh, Lost Planet 2 is one of those games that has a DX11 mode and they have a DX9 and 10 mode, and when you run it, you can see visual differences uh, that can't be represented in graphs necessarily, uh, but we'll try to get some screenshots and that kind of stuff as well. So you get performance benefits, you're going to get image quality benefits. So that's something that uh, we're we talking be about like massive eye popping image quality benefits or just something where you, you, you mm. know what I mean? Like there's some things you look at and you go, yeah, like the first time you saw real anti aliasing, it was, it was kind of mind blowing. And then they go to Forex right. anti aliasing and you're like, oh, the Jaggies are gone until you get like this close to the monitor. Right. So are, are we talking about anything that dramatic between 10 and 11 or? No, probably not uh, that dramatic in this case. Um, but one of the things that you will be able to see is, well, like, take, for example, Metro 2033. Um, you know, the way we do our benchmarking, we do apples to apples. So we, we, we set the same settings as close as possible, especially considering they're 11, DX11 versus DX10. And we run benchmarks uh, of the exact same sections and, and that type of stuff to get comparable results. But uh, because the 9800 GTX scores so low, 
uh, result in that. We're talking under 10 frames a second at 19 by 12. Then what the right. user will do is scale back on image quality settings until they reach, you know, that 35 to 40 frames per second. That's really like your minimum for a good quality PC gaming scenario. And mm -hmm. then that is where you'll see image quality differences. Not necessarily like if you had uh, a GTX 580 and you ran the DX10 version versus the DX11 version, there might be small visual differences, but not that dramatic. But when you have a slower performing card, the differences that you might have to make in the settings themselves in order to get playable frame rates will produce pretty dramatic uh, image quality differences. Because, I mean, if you look at NVIDIA when they launched the GTX 560 actually had kind of a, like a, a couple of demonstrations of this. They showed, here's if you play Crisis Warhead um, on, a, on a GTX 560 today versus if you played it right. on an 8800 GT, I think is what they use as their demonstration. And they weren't showing DX9 versus DX11 or anything like that. They're just showing... Here's with an average frame rate of 40 frames per second. Here's what you can get. And the dramatic and the difference was, was pretty substantial there. Um, so we'll, we'll try to look at some of that kind of stuff as well and, and, and demonstrate exactly what <laughs> you're getting for your dollar. What's at this going point. on here? Yeah, I mean, because you can always get 60 frames a second with any, you know, not with any, but <laughs> with two and three year old graphics cards. Just depends on what you what you care about the quality of the image on the screen. So there's nothing wrong with eight bit graphics, a la Pac Man. It's just exactly. a little sad when you're playing Crisis when you're doing it. Um, I I, <laughs> I I want to bring something up from uh, Dean in Perth, Australia, who took great offense with my Crisis comments. Um, first of all, ah. he wants to, he wants to say he first played it with an 8800 GTX SLI setup and performance was fine with a bit of tweaking and almost everything maxed out, which is awesome if you could afford two of those cards at that time. Uh, but more importantly. Dean would like to point out, Crisis averages 91 out of 100 on Metacritic and is one of a small number that has near infinite replay value due to the sandbox nature of the game. Patrick, did you play the game till the end? No, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, but uh, I, I would like to, to apologize to Dean and all the other Crisis enthusiasts who, enthusiasts who may be out there in the uh, This Week in Computer Hardware audience. Yeah, you don't uh, have to apologize. Everybody's allowed to have their own opinions. I, I didn't particularly enjoy Crisis, but uh, <laughs> Dean wanted to point out that, and, and nobody I actually know personally in Meat Space enjoyed Crisis, but obviously it was big with the reviewers and not just uh, video game benchmark artists. <laughs> Crisis 2 should be out uh, before the end of March, I am told, as of today. So I will give it another shot. There you go. So uh, Intel. Uh, Intel is actually selling the dual core CPUs with the current chipset because they do not have the SATA 3.0 issues, question mark, or they don't care? Um, it's kind of they don't care, right? So there are, <laughs> there are two separate little stories that kind of came out uh, this week. Uh, one was that they were planning on shipping the dual core variant of Sandy Bridge on February 20th. And the last week we talked about the dual core versions of the uh, processor being delayed because of the whole chipset fiasco, right? Well, apparently right. that's not the case. And I'm a little bit, you know, they're not answering anything else other than the official statements that they put up on their website about these problems and about these, these issues and complications. But it seems to me that what is happening is they're going to ship the dual core variant uh, probably only in the mobile form factor. And th in reality, this is where they need it the most. This is where... Right. You know, we're going to get into the four, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollar notebooks uh, that are going to be able to extend battery life and that type of stuff further than the quad core options that were available right after the Sandy Bridge launch. So what I think is going to happen is we're going to see dual core mobile versions, which are basically identical to uh, desktop versions, but with bend for lower power consumption. And, you know, when it, you first read that, you're like really confused. Like, what good is it going to do if <laughs> you still don't have a chipset that works with it? Kind of uh, probably not coincidentally, they announced that they were going to resume shipment of the current B2 stepping, the flawed slash broken version of the 6 Series chipset, Cougar Point, to certain customers that they felt or that they deemed were, were competent enough to make sure that this didn't affect their customers. And they didn't get any more detailed than that, but it it really only comes down to, to, to one of two ways they can do that. The first, and I, and I hope, hopefully the only way they're going to do it, 
is by shipping it in notebooks. Right. Notebooks typically don't have more than one SATA port, maybe two, right? Maybe you use one SATA, connect, not really SATA ports either, but we're talking SATA connections. One for your hard drive, maybe one for your optical drive. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just, you know, uh, maybe if you've got a high-end laptop, you've got two different hard drives or something like that in there. Uh, so you might have two SATA connections that way. And because the two SATA 6.0 gigabit per second channels on the chipset are apparently not affected, you know, you could build a system, not enable those 3.0 gigabit per second ports, still use the chipset, and you would be functionally identical to what will be coming out with the B3 revision uh, in March. The, so there's yeah. also a possibility, which probably would be less thrilling for you, is, is one of the things that's, that came out, I remember several years ago, is Dell said, you know, less than 10% of their customers, and this is many years ago, probably less than five or ten percent of their customers ever actually cracked open the case and did anything inside the pc so right. the other thing is they they could be selling it to vendors that are going to integrate these motherboards and systems um and just plug everything into the six gigabit port i would doubt that i would i would assume that they're going to send them out to notebook vendors at a discount which would be very attractive for notebook sure. vendors and pricing we hope but um yeah the, it's, the, it's, the, the, you're right the desktop idea is so much less palatable. Like I realize very few people that buy a Dell are probably breaking open their system and adding in another hard drive. But when you say it like that, it's, you know, in two years, somebody's going to put in a 10 terabyte hard drive because that's what's going to be new at the time. And they're <laughs> just going to plug it into the port, right? The instructions in the hard drive are going to say, plug it into an open SATA port. They're going to plug it into an open SATA port and they're, they may or may not have issues with that. The other well, thing you could kind of you could kind of hope that the instructions tell them to plug it into the six gigabit SATA port if you have one. Although but at that you, point, I'm sure we'll have like twelve gigabit SATA. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're if you're a normal consumer, right, and you've got the two already plugged up, yeah. one for your optical drive and one for your current hard drive, then you know you're just plugging the cables into whatever matches. And you know, one thing that they could do is that they could ship like one of those uh, add-in PCI or PCI Express storage cards. Um, that has four SATA 3.0 gigabit ports on it and kind of, you know, replace the ones on the motherboard with the ones on the add-in card. But, I mean, unless, I don't, they're not going to take it out and take those connections off the motherboard. So I don't know if they're going to, like, put duct tape over them so <laughs> nobody accidentally plugs them into those instead of the ones on the controller card or something. It, it seems like there's a lot more headache that could potentially result in that decision. No, I, I, I think you're right. I, you're, I, Let's just hope they all go to notebooks and that nobody in the Twitch audience finds themselves dealing with a problematic three gigabit SATA port. Um, motherboard vendors are starting exchanges already. It seems like we've we've heard from, I want to say, is it Gigabyte, MSI, and Asus or yeah, just two and, of those Yeah, and, and ECS as well. Pretty much all mm -hmm. of, the, of the major board vendors have kind of started their uh, – if not started their process, kind of announced what their process is going to be. I think probably the most advanced one right now is, is MSI. They have a form where you can go right now and fill out, register your, uh, your motherboard if you hadn't registered it before, um, get basically in line for the upgrade. Uh, ASUS has the same type of thing set up. Gigabyte has the same type of thing. Pretty much everybody's doing the exact same process as far as I can tell. Um, the one thing that I was kind of hoping for, I, th I think I mentioned – uh, a week or two ago when we first saw the problem was like the the idea of an advanced replacement where if this right. is your only computer, you don't want to have to send your motherboard, wait three days for it to arrive, uh, <laughs> wait for them to test it or not test it, but, you know, register that they got it, you know, or send one to two business days and then send it back to you and wait another three days. You're out, you know, a, a, a whole work week or more without your computer. ASUS is the only one who's kind of announced something to that effect. They do advanced replacements, not where they send you the motherboard first, but as soon as they see from UPS that they have accepted a shipment with the, with the prepaid label that they give you, then they will ship yours out. So it's, it's cross-shipped as opposed right. to advanced ship. I don't, I don't know what exact term we want to use there, but it's, it's closer. <laughs> it's closer at least. You know, and anything that these guys can do, uh, hopefully on Intel's dime, to minimize the downtime for 
you know, l- viewers of this show, listeners of this show, and anybody else out there that, that built a Sandy Bridge system uh, would, would be greatly appreciated. But it looks like everybody's pretty much on board with the same type of deal. Um, most people are off also offering refunds, right? So, you know, if you don't want to wait until mid in March or whatever it's going to be, you know, they'll give you your money back. Uh, you just got to provide a receipt from where you bought it. And uh, if, you know, they'll help you. New eggs is more than willing to provide refunds at this point because they're just sending them back to the motherboard guys. And then you can, right. you know, email us in questions about what you can get instead of Sandy Bridge and, and continue to build a new system. So um, pretty much as we expected, I guess, at this point with the returns. Oh, did you mute? I think you muted. Sorry, at the tail end of my cold allergy thing, so I'm still trying to ride yeah. the mute button to keep people from hearing too much of my breathing and wheezing. Um, <laughs> HP announced a, a pair of, of TouchSmart PCs, uh, one for business, one for home. The uh, HP TouchSmart 610 PC, 23-inch, basically all-in-one monitor with a PC built-in, Core i7, uh, uh, and actually uh, Intel and AMD CPUs is an option on this one. <laughs> but the big thing about this one is it's not just a 23-inch touchscreen computer, but it reclines, which is kind of an interesting concept. So you can sort of grab your monitor in front of you and pull it down 60 degrees so you have the touch screen in front of you in a way that makes it much easier to use. Uh, having experimented with several of the all-in-one and 24-inch uh, 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 touch screen monitors, there's something really irritating about reaching out to poke your monitor in front of you, but right. I think it'll be are, much more usable. Are you trying to say usable. Steve Jobs was right? Uh, you know, it, it, that would be one way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> He's been right about many things. He um, has. But yeah, it, it actually, I mean, because it's kind of funny when I'm typing, right? I want my monitor up at eye level in front of me and that sort of, you know, box at eye level. But when right. you're when you're holding things, it's it's miserable to reach forward and manipulate the screen like this. When you actually have the screen down in front of you, it's much more natural. It's like you have a book on a stand and it makes it much more engaging. Um, yeah. I'm going to be starting at around $900. Blu-ray is an option. Um I have a 11 Wi-Fi, Bluetooth built in, uh, the Beats Audio, which is which is their HP's version of uh, Dre's uh, optimizations on the audio stream, which is not bad. Um, but <clears throat> I have yet to try that out. I'd be curious to see if I can actually tell a difference from like a Beats Audio system on a laptop <laughs> or a machine like this than something else. Would be. Curious. I should also. Oh, go ahead. I said just. I'm just saying. I would be curious to see if I could tell a difference. As well, much as they it, advertise it, it's it's interesting. I mean, you can you can sort of F five to turn it on and off. It's certainly it it sort of fills out the sound a little bit. It's not bad actually. It it works especially well on uh, more modern, heavily produced uh, music. I think that it does in some of the older stuff in my catalog. And of course, they're also going to have the uh, business version of of the Touch Smart computer. Although I'm not entirely sure who in the office would be lining up for that one, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, I mean, like, you know, who's who can justify buying a, you know, brand new machine with a reclining monitor? Of course, at under $1,000, it's probably going to be half as much as your last office machine cost. It could, it, 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 does it still have the recline? I mean, in, in touchscreen, it might be good for point-of-sale systems or something like that, but, yeah, That's I mean. True. Well, ki- a like normal... a kiosk-type design or getting people yeah. to sign in at the front of the office. Yeah, it's not bad. It starts at 900 bucks, which is a pretty These good deal for a 23-inch yeah. flat panel with a built-in uh, – uh, AMD Athlon 2, 245E. How much are they getting for the 2222? Sorry, Is it now AMD I'm trying to find 350 like the... or something like that. So that's a fusion based platform, then, if so. Yeah. That's Interesting. Not no, not too bad at all, actually. But I, I, I think it's a smart idea, actually, making the. Uh, you know, I just wish Windows 7 was a better uh, yeah. touch based I... operating system. It works. Well, uh, I've tested a couple well of uh, touchscreen-based PCs, one from Dell, um, that it, like the, the, it was the screen company that sent it out. And the, and, and the, the multi-touch and everything worked really well, but there was just so few use cases uh, for a Windows 7-based platform. You know, they have like some demos and stuff where you can move your finger around and affect water <laughs> and boats and like there's like little games and stuff like that. And it's just like, yeah, I need more use for this. Um, we, we, we've experimented here in the office building one of those um, Johnny Lee Wiimote 
whiteboards on a like an, on a 50 inch plasma type of thing. Right. Still a work in progress, but that seems to me to be a little bit more interesting for me in in, in my use cases. But yeah, those I'll are pretty a, slick. Take a quick break here. Thank the first of today's sponsors, Squarespace.com. They are the fast and easy way to build a high quality website or blog. They have an easy to use user interface for creating and managing your website or blog, optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. So if you know nothing about HTML uh, 5 or below, then you can still build a website very easily using a lot of templates that they have. But if you're a CSS expert, you can go in, you can uh, start from a template and modify it, make changes, or you can start completely, completely from scratch if if that's what you want to do. They have hundreds of those design templates. It's an all-inclusive service that includes uh, modules to build your site like uh, blog modules, forums, uh, form builders if you want to collect email addresses or other information from your site visitors. It has Flickr photo display. It's really good for photographers. Uh, Twitter widgets. It has Google Maps integration as well. Website tracking, built-in search engine optimizing, permissions access handling. If you and uh, several friends want to edit the same website, you can change what uh, each person is allowed to do. If you want one person only to be able to edit their own stuff. Cloud architecture is what powers this. A, a, a custom cloud architecture that they built for this means that when your site gets really, really popular, which is obviously the goal. You don't have to worry about the servers crashing because of too much traffic. It, the, the, the architecture is such that it, the amount of processing power required for your site increases. The number of servers, virtual servers that act on it increases as well. It's very cool. Innovative drag and drop Ajax interface. So if you want to move components around, again, getting back into that really easy to design method. They do have an iPhone application as well. So if you want to do updating on the go without uh, having to load up the full web page or something like that, that is also very helpful. You can use Squarespace for all of your website needs to build it, host it, and update it at any time. For a 14-day free trial, go to squarespace.com slash twitch. That's T-W-I-C-H. Sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card. Just try it out and build your website. You can get two free weeks so you can you can import information from uh, other blog uh, systems. And you also have data portability. So if you want to take that information out again, you can still do that. But it's, there's, there's no reason you shouldn't try Squarespace uh, for this. With the 14-day free trial, no credit card, uh, visit squarespace.com slash twitch. And we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you, Squarespace. Indeed. First email, we got Mike looking for a two-and-a-half-inch external storage option. This is, I, I want to know how he ended up with several two and a half inch notebook drives. He's looking for a video storage solution. He would like to use these notebook drives in a network storage box, a NAS. He says, I've seen several solutions for three and a half inch drives, such as a Drobo, but I've failed to find any for two and a half inch drives. I'm going to update all the hard disk drives on my wife's laptop and mine to SSDs. I currently have five extra two and a half inch drives, all in enclosures, and we'll soon have two more. All I need is a box to connect them all. Come to think of it, I would even be happy with a simple USB hookup to attach to the Roku. If it would support RAID, that would be a bonus. There are occasionally two and a half inch uh, sort of drive bay yep. enclosures. Um, I'm looking at one now uh, from QNAP. It's called the SS839 Pro, and it uh, actually holds, let's see, eight SATA drives, two and a half inch hmm. drives built for it. The unfortunate part is when you get into something like this specific, right. you get pretty expensive and um, <laughs> yeah this one is like 880 dollars whoa uh, diskless at that so uh it's a uh, turbo nas with advanced security right. and iSCSI for business users so this is more of you know more expensive than you might expect for for the home user i mean you can always go three and a half inch model and get the adapters right yeah, that's what I was going to say is, is you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, way to go, man. You know, for 10 bucks a pop, you can get either drive tray adapters with a little sort of uh, SATA adapter for a two and a half inch to three and a half inch drive or an actual physical box where your two and a half inch drive goes inside that plastic case that's the size of a three and a half inch drive and has the SATA plugs like on a three and a half inch drive and just slide that into the case. Um, mm -hmm. I would also say, to be honest with you, um, you know, I've never been overly impressed with the survival rate of two and a half inch hard drives. I think that's 
mostly because they're usually in notebooks. Uh, they get banged around Bounced and moved around, around yeah. a lot. Um, so, you know, I would, I would not use these for critical data. Um, you know, I'd also say, man, how big are these notebook drives? Because at some point, you know, if you're looking at a stack of notebook drives, you know, and it's going to cost you 250 bucks for an enclosure plus a bunch of another 50 or 60 bucks for enclosures to put the two and a half inch drives inside of there. You know, you can buy a, a nice one or two or three, you know, like a two terabyte drive or a three terabyte drive stuff in a Western digital adapter. Um, I yep. would probably go with a simple USB hookup, just get a, 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 a bunch of USB ports. I mean, then the downside is like you end up with six separate drives with data on them. <sighs> um, never really the best idea. Yeah, and RAID on two and a half inch drives that have been living in notebooks for a while seems like just a wonderful recipe for pain <laughs> and failure. Um, I mean, it looks like uh, the article I found, Small Net Builder, one of, I know, your favorite sites. I love uh, them. They, they, they do some really good NAS reviews on there as well. Uh, looks like all the ones more recently are, are three and a half inch, but they, had, they do have some listings for a couple of two and a half inch versions. I still like, I mean, his, even his own last idea there, which is um, USB hookup to attach, you know, I mean, you can get two and a half inch external hard drive docks or uh, not docks, but external units that then have USB cables and stuff really, really, really cheap. Right. Gosh, I wonder what, um, sorry, I'm thinking about like the whole, uh, can you still, I can't remember, I've, you know, I haven't tried to do dynamic disk in Windows 7. Mm. No, I, have, I haven't tried that either, where you just connect a bunch up and it kind of manages all that. Yeah, I'm right. trying to remember if that's still, uh, no. it's basically, uh, you know, I know in Windows XP you can do a span disk, mm -hmm. um, basically create a dynamic disk, a, a disk that spans multiple hard drives. Um, yeah, it's still, I don't, it's anything where like RAID, RAID 0, one drive <laughs> goes out, and you lose all the data on it. Uh, I tend to have a problem with so. All right, so yeah. keep it, keep them as separate drives. I think is is what what yeah. you probably should be taking from this conversation. I, I like. think so. Let's see. We got an email uh, from Scott about. Um, actually, we got several emails on this topic in this week. Way more than I thought. Uh, remember last week we talked about the the. Uh, the reader that had the reader, the, the viewer listener that had a, a, a by eight slot on his server class motherboard, PCI Express by eight slot, but he wanted right. to put a discrete graphics card in it. Well, they all come with by 16 and you can't actually physically fit a by 16 card into by eight slot. So the first answer we got from Scott here is about a riser card that might work. Um, we have a link here to it in our show notes if we can bring that up. And it's and it basically exactly as it sounds. It's an adapter that will plug into a by 8 slot, but then creates a space for a by 16 slot. Now, it works, and they say electrically this should provide no problems at all. The problem will be uh, this obviously raises the height of your graphics card in the system. So you're going to have, I mean... The, you're going to have problems, you know, if you're using a standard case, bringing that into uh, your system, being able to screw it down and tighten it into the system. You might not even be able to install it depending on what type of uh, audio video connections that graphics card has and how far they, they stick out beyond the case and, you know, uh, just how much other garbage is going to be in the way there. It's <laughs> reasonably priced at like $40, which... It, it, reasonable, I guess, for something that's that's kind of unique like that. The other option that is suggested here, and I was very surprised to see this uh, when I read it the first time, I thought, well, that seems kind of chancy. And then I think I got, we got like five other emails with this exact same suggestion. The one I first read was from Nick, who says the other option is to use needle nose pliers and snap off the edge of the slot farthest from the back plane of the motherboard. This will allow huh. the card to seat properly in the slot and will only use the provided by eight pins. The other half of the card's pins will be unused, but the card will still function. Um, I have never tried this before, obviously, but like four or five people sent in this exact thing. Somebody showed, um, you know, heating up uh, an exacto knife with a flame, with a with a like a mini torch, so that you can like easily cut through the plastic on the slot as well. Uh, some other unique options that way. 
but the consensus seems to be here is that if you can break off or remove somehow that piece of plastic that keeps it uh, from being a completed socket at the end, that you can just slide the card in there. And as long as there's no capacitors or things in the way that will interfere with you, know, you sliding the, car in all the w- card in all the way, it sounds like it's going to work. Sounds like an awesome hack to me. It does. And, you know, it's one of those things, um, be very careful. Your mileage will vary. We're not liable for any problems, especially if you're trying to break off pieces of your motherboard and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, find somebody who's really comfortable with tools because uh, the last yeah. thing you want to do is the, the worst thing you can do with a motherboard with all those little tiny service mouse components is try to force something. For example, mm-hmm. try to crack off the end of that. The, the end of the slot should break off fairly easily, but be very gentle with it. Use both hands, like place the needle nose pliers very carefully, hold them with both hands, then sort of, you know, twist and break off. Because if you sort of grab something, gank, and the pliers slip, they will invariably bounce across the surface of the motherboard, popping off surface mount components as you go. Um, And while, yes, you can re-solder those little tiny two millimeter long or wide uh, (laughs) uh, resistors and capacitors, it is is an emotionally scarring uh, project (laughs) for anybody that is not well trained in the process. There have been many instances where I have uh, been trying to maybe screw in a heat sink, uh, slipped, stabbed the PCB and scratched out some traces or something like that and gone, well, yeah. there goes that graphics card or something like that, you know. There's this Those especially are... awesome noise that, that like a little <laughs> resistor or capacitor, surface mount capacitor makes as it sort of bounces off the inside <laughs> of your case and then falls down between the motherboard and the side of the case. Oh, let's just move right on to Mike's question. <laughs> he's, yes, let's. he's got a problem with horizontal motion in video, which kind of looks like Terran to me. Send a lot of graphic, a, a, an image. He's got a Asus NVIDIA 570 SLI dual core E5 200 processor, two gigs of memory, and a GeForce GTX, excuse me, a, a Asus P5N a motherboard and an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 260 uh, PCI Express graphics card. Mm-hmm. And he is he basically sent an image uh, so we could experience the problem he's having with fast horizontal motion. He was using an old CRT monitor, 1024 by 768, and experienced the same issue. Just got an Asus ML 228H 22-inch ultra-sim widescreen LED monitor. Uh, it's supposed to have a two-millisecond response time. Now the issue is bothering him more than I ever have. He has the latest mm-hmm. firmware for the BIOS on the motherboard and the video driver uh, running G66.58, running Windows XP, and doesn't know what to do. So he sent so in a picture a, of it. Yeah. It's really weird looking. Um, I, I mean, that's – that's. Uh, do we know – we all know what vertical sync is. Vertical sync is the idea that your uh, graphics display, your monitor, uh, he says he's using a CRT, so those have variable refresh rates. So we'll just go with 60. That's kind of the most common, which means your screen can only update its image 60 times a second. Meanwhile, your graphics card can update (laughs) potentially much faster than that. And the problem that I think is occurring here, I I can't say 100% sure because I've almost like never seen it in a 2D version, or maybe he's just making an example of what it kind of looked like. But right. when your graphics card changes the contents of the frame buffer that are being written out to the panel faster than 60 frames per second, then if it does it as the monitor is scaling, if it changes the, the frame here, then all the items that are being drawn below it are going to not match up with the lines that were coming in above it. And so that right. in the image there would kind of would explain why Spider-Man is slightly shifted to the right uh, on the bottom half of that screen and why the text is doing things like that. And so he, he's saying... Um, it he, only doesn't see it. Is he doesn't see it with DVDs. He doesn't see it when he's browsing the internet doing basic stuff. He does see it, all screen resolutions, Netflix streaming and other streaming video, and in video gameplay. So it's, it's 3D gaming and online streaming of video maybe involving... Uh, it could be doing GPU do. acceleration right. on the streaming video which would might explain that. So uh, my my answer to this is going to be go into your contr- in the uh, Nvidia control panel and make sure that you have 
uh, enabled vertical sync. It'll be an option under the right. 3D settings. Uh, go in there and make sure that's if, if it's set on auto or application controlled, go ahead and set it to force on and see if that same problem occurs. Um, a lot of people turn it off for games because it artificially limits your frame rate to 60 frames per second. And a lot of people, if they feel like they just want to get all the performance out of their card, that they'll disable it. But I think for the best visual experience while gaming, it's always better to have uh, V-Sync on. So right. I, I think that's the case. I, I, I've seen it lots of times in gameplay. I've never seen it. Um, while streaming video online or watching Netflix or anything like that. So, um, well, I mean, Netflix little... streaming would be a silver light thing. Yeah. And I don't think there's like GPU acceleration, uh, in silver light or anything like that yet. So that's why I'm a little bit confused as to why it might actually be that, but that's the only thing I can possibly think of. So, uh, Scott, I would say, uh, or Mike rather give that a shot. Um, Oops. Nice. My my Let's beloved see. CEO Jim Louderback just popped in. <laughs> I thought lights were falling on you or something like that. You looked very you looked very worried and scared there for a second. Uh, let's get to an email from Steve about an SSD and GPU upgrade. He says, uh, "Hey guys, love the show. You guys talked me into moving my operating system partition to an SSD drive, and the speed is amazing. I have an Athlon X2 three gigahertz system, AM2 plus motherboard with eight gigs of memory, Windows 7 Pro." It doesn't play games, mostly use the computer for work uh, slash internet slash word processing and VMware. I do occasional video encodes, but not a lot. Would I see any improvement by adding a discrete video card? I would probably not spend more than $50. My current video card is onboard ATI 4200 series uh, using 512 megs of RAM. And I'm assuming that that's actually shared memory, so it's coming out of system memory. Um, this one, occasional video encoding. So unless you're going to do uh, GPU-based video encoding, if you're going to use an application that does GPU acceleration, you're probably not going to see any, any speed, speed ups in that. Uh, we've had a couple of people write in and say that they do see improvements in their virtualization performance with the discrete graphics card uh, using right. rather than using integrated graphics. I'm not... I'm not exactly sure in what instances that is, if you're doing graphics intense stuff on those virtualized machines or just in general for virtualized machines. I know the SSD and the 8 gigs of memory are probably a big boost uh, for, for VMs. Um, and if it's not going to spend more than $50. $50. That was the one where I got it. I was like, yeah, $50 video cards are not going to be real killers for, for video yeah. encoding or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, the ATI 4200 is not new. It's not right. state-of-the-art. It's not, uh, you know, the best integrated graphics you can get anymore. But if, if you're not seeing slowdowns uh, with games that you're not playing, apparently, or anything like that, or, you know, high-definition flash video, if you see slowdowns in that, if you've ever tried to play a YouTube video at 1080p and it's pretty right. choppy or something like that, which it shouldn't be with that processor, Um I, I would say you're probably not, it's not worth upgrading to a discrete video card unless your budget is going to be $150 or so. Have you even seen a fifty a card that's selling for $50 online that will accelerate like Blu-ray or 1080, you know, 1080p flash or anything oh, yeah. like that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much anything you can buy now from AMD or NVIDIA is going to do uh, acceleration. I mean, right. is it, the, the AMD Fusion processors the E350, the E3240, uh, I don't know the model numbers, but even those, you know, dime-sized CPU-GPU combinations are, go are doing, uh, of, as of Flash 10.2 at least, cool. GPU acceleration on those types of things. It's actually pretty cool. So Nice. Yep. Doug has a question about AMD Fusion Mini ITX motherboards. When will they ship? Will these be great for a little home theater PC to play Blu-ray, stream Netflix, and record over-the-air HD? Um. Gosh, I would have thought those would have been out already. Ta-da! Check the link right below the question. Auto notify. Yep. Um, that was actually in stock at one point, so they have been okay. released. Um, <laughs> I also have, I have an MSI one that I can't, let me see if I can find it again, because I thought that one was for sale too. I don't see it either. Uh, but they are, if they're not out, 
by the time you are viewing this or listening to this in the recorded version, then they really, really should be any day now because there are reviews out of them. Um, that ASUS one was for sale at one point. Uh, I have uh, the both the MSI and the ASUS one here that we're doing testing on as well. Right. They they are right around the corner. Um, can they can they do HTPC and Blu-ray and Netflix? Yes. Uh, Netflix um, Netflix doesn't use Flash, does it? No, Netflix is uses, based on Silverlight. Okay. There, as far as I know, there is still no Silverlight GPU acceleration. Uh, I still think the dual core variants that will be on these mini ITX motherboards, uh, the dual core uh, Bobcat cores on the CPU section will be powerful enough to do. Netflix kind of maxes out at 720p. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, in yeah. theory, they've got some 1080p on, on I want to say that, yeah, for all intents and purposes, 720p HD okay. is what you're going to run into on yeah. Netflix with any degree of regularity. Yeah, I, I, I am in, I am in uh, looking forward to using these exact system for these systems for that exact purpose for a small home theater right. PC. Uh, I don't. He wants to record over the air HD. I don't think that will be a problem as long as you can get the you know the appropriate tuner into your um, mini ITX form factor, either <laughs> chassis or you know, they most of them will come with one PCI Express slot, so that should work for that. But yeah, I think. These motherboards and this platform in particular are going to really, really, really show um, their improvements over the Intel Atom platform for right. this. Purpose. You know, they're not going to be great for gaming because the CPU and GPUs are, are competent but not fast. And there's no point in adding a $100 discrete graphics card to a mini ITX motherboard like this to do gaming because... Yeah, you know, well, we've got into that before, but um, <laughs> for, for this use, for having the computer hooked up to your TV that's only going to do that one specific thing, I think there's going to be great low power, really quiet uh, options there. And th this should be a nice, healthy step up from the, the Atom Ion processors, or the, I say the Atom processors that, that won't do flash video of any size, the Atom Ion processors, which will right. do flash video, but um, this will be a nice sort of... Uh, performance step up from yep. that. I would also like to point out that if you are going to get uh, a cable card adapter for your mini ITX box, if you're not going to put your mini ITX board in a big giant full-size ATX case, shop carefully uh, or, or get really comfortable sort of sawing right. out sections of the back of the case to make sure everything fits awesome. on that one. <laughs> nice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> always be careful, I guess. Let's uh, well, take just a second. Make sure Make sure it fits as soon as the case arrives, uh, and, and then you can decide whether or not to modify it or return it. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to return once you've gotten the hacksaw out, I guess. True. Uh, we have uh, another sponsor that's uh, bringing you This Week in Computer Hardware. Again, this is very weak. That would be MailRoute. Businesses of every size are using MailRoute. If you've got one user, 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. They can protect you from spam viruses. They can simplify your life and make your email usable again usable again, rather. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that filters virus and spam for companies of any size. Uh, it, it can eliminate viruses and spam, reduce the load on your own email servers, lower your costs, and to make your email usable. Typical MailRoute customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volume uh, with virtually no false positives. I would imagine with 95% reduction in inbound email volume, if you're a large company, this could mean Less servers, less money, hence the saving you money aspect. Now, Leo loves MailRoute. He's been using the service on his domains for more than six years and has been his top choice for spam and virus protection all along. Tom Merritt started using MailRoute. Now he can use email domains that he'd given up on being, uh, giving, that he had given up on being able to use at all as completely helpless. Tom Johnson, the founder and CEO of MailRoute, started one of the first companies in this market back in 98 called FrontBridge. It was acquired by Microsoft in 2005 and is still offered as the Microsoft Exchange hosted services line. Tom wasn't done, though, and had too many good ideas, so he couldn't stand to go to waste. So he started MailRoute, his next generation service for email filtering with a level of accuracy and a price that's unmatchable. There's nothing easier for mail filtering than MailRoute. There's no hardware or software you have to install on your machine. You just sign up for MailRoute and then change the MX records for your domain to start mail flowing through them, and then they do all the work for you. Visit MailRoute.com, uh, or I'm sorry, MailRoute.info to sign up. As a Twit listener, you'll receive 10% discount for the life of your account. Small business accounts start at just $2 per user per month for 10 users. And because of the demand of the Twit army, MailRoute has added a new service for individual 
users as well. Less than $30 per user per year for single users. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom and Leo use. And we thank MailRoute for their support of this very show. Uh, let's see, I think we've got a couple more emails and some tweets to get to. You want to jump into this one from Christian? Uh, Christian says, I'm saddled with a gaming PC that's louder than my sound system. Water cooling has crossed my mind, but everything I've found has been either for the CPU or the GPU. No combo systems. Does such a beast exist or not? Generally speaking, uh, most of the uh, water block vendors, water cooling vendors, um, they they sell kits, right? The all-in-one kits you've seen, uh, it's a little loud, but the, the Corsair Hydro Series 870 is mm -hmm. pretty solid, kind of, you know, everything's enclosed. You don't have to put plumbing inside of your PC because it's all sealed and ready to go. But right. you're, you're absolutely correct. Because the, the PC cases and PC motherboards and, and which slot you put your graphics card in or if you have a single card or, or SLI or, or, you know, there are so many variables in between the CPU and the GPU or GPUs inside the case. They generally don't pre-make um, water cooling bundles for those. However, pretty much everybody rolls their own, and that's where it gets a little yep. bit exciting. Um, I've had a lot of fun. Uh, there's a, a fairly local shop to us, Petra's Tech Shop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, they don't have as, as many options as they've had in the past of a Petra's tech shop. But one of my favorite websites, uh, actually Kyle over at Hard OCP turned me on to this one, frozencpu.com. And if you click down on the left side, you'll see liquid cooling. And, oh, boy, are things going to get out of control in your life. Um, you know, <laughs> I... I I got to say, I love liquid cooling. I, I know people like Kyle from Hard OCP where every system in their house or at least their office has a water cooling system on it. Um, right. The more times you kind of like, hey, I'm going to take, you know, this radiator and this tank and this clear vinyl tubing and all these little connectors and I'm going to run water inside of my PC. It gets, you know, it's like a lot of things where, you know, it's only kinky the first time. Um, the second or third time you run a bunch of plastic tubing inside your expensive case above your expensive motherboard next to your expensive uh, CPU, it, it doesn't seem nearly as scary. Um, right. I have uh, seen uh, water spills wipe out motherboards uh, because they will obviously... We've had emails about that, yeah. <laughs> I've had emails about that. I've, I've, I've seen it happen in our lab, so I would say it's something you definitely <laughs> want to sort of measure twice, cut once, take your time doing, but it can be really fun to put together a combination of, you know, a high-end water block and a radiator. I The last radiator I used actually was out of a, uh, I think it was a Dodge minivan six-cylinder. So it was literally a full-size car radiator. I mean, uh -huh. not like full-size, like 1970s GM freaking V8, but literally a, it, it was about the size of the case and I bolted it to the side of the case. So it took forever for that to heat up and stabilize. And uh, it was incredibly efficient to have have the giant fan, electrical fan from the car on there. Ran it at five volts. Otherwise, it would have, you know, blown itself across the table. But at five nice. volts, it was super quiet. Did an amazing job cooling because there was so much surface area. But it does start to get expensive. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you can usually move water blocks from CPU and GPU to CPU and GPU and kind of keep them as you upgrade and move your systems. But the last one I built, which had a, a pretty decent... Um, pump and you can get into a lot of trouble with the pump because if you don't figure out how to isolate the pump the pump will rattle the side of the case uh and and you'll hear this irritating noise it sounds like a fish tank um pump in yep. the back of your system because essentially these are all sorts of variations on on inexpensive pumps but you know you can easily spend two three four hundred dollars on this which is why i might really suggest true. um you might want to consider upgrading. There's so many for like 50 or 60 bucks. You can get an amazing air cooling fan for your CPU. And for probably less than that, um, you know, we're looking at fans that are operating at 20 or 30 decibels uh, at max that are doing a great job of cooling your CPU. And then I would also suggest maybe getting a another aftermarket fan for your GPU because um, it's amazing you know, it's, it's water cooling is awesome. It's fun. It's super geeky. It's great for overclocking, but it's kind of a big pain in the ass to set it up. Unless you're like really in yep. the mood for a Saturday project where you're going to track mm. down your tube and your connectors and build the system up. Um, I, I would probably I mean, I'm, say, I'm looking at, I'm looking at that frozen CPU site and there is a, an right. entire section dedicated to 
PC water cooling radiator screws. Yeah. You know, so I mean, get, you you got to have a level of detail when you're if you're if you're not going in locally and you're going to have to order all this stuff right. in to start your Saturday project, uh, you're definitely going <laughs> to want a lot of pre-planning going into that. Yeah, it's uh, it is definitely worth you know measure twice, cut once. Um, I'd hmm. almost say you know I, I I think unless you really want to put the time into it in the planning, take a really close look at the VGA heatsink coolers that are up there on frozen CPU. Uh, you know, yeah. I was amazed at what a difference it made for my main desktop um, when I upgraded. I'm trying to find it. Like, of course, did they stop selling it? Um, do, 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 do. Why is it is always it the like... Is something? Uh, Are you talking about a CPU cooler or a VGA cooler? Uh, a CPU cooler. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have one of those moments where I, like, clicked on the wrong link, and all of a sudden I'm in, like, a... 72 pages of of air coolers um, yes there are lots of those yeah the, the, but I, mean, the, I mean you're right you can get you can get some high-end air coolers uh that are going to be very very quiet uh he doesn't really say in particular which part is loud in his system right. um so you know you, you can get replacements for both probably save money definitely save time and probably get pretty comparable on that on that noise level. And um, hopefully yeah. we get some emails from the water cooling purists that that tell us how idiotic <laughs> and stupid we are uh, for thinking something like that. But that's what we, makes we it probably yeah. You you've you've got to love water cooling to do it. Um, by the way, the Thermalright Co Gauge True Spirit uh, is a Core i7 CPU cooler. Uh, the price is down to forty bucks. It is. It, in 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 overclocking benchmarks, it hangs in there with some of the most expensive uh, air coolers out there. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, Thermalright co gauge, co gauge co gauge is pretty amazing. And I'm trying to think of one that's like a nice passive, or you know, when you when you're looking at the VGA cooler, look for one with a big fan where you have the option of turning down the speed because it's amazing how much difference. Um, it's amazing how much diff you know what I mean the. Vendors that make GPUs are not looking to make quiet fans. They're looking for the least expensive way to keep the right. uh, <laughs> the, the the GPU in the thermal envelope so they don't get any returns. So it's it's kind of amazing what an upgrade can do. Yep. And I talked about that way for too long. You want to help That's Russell right. out in Afghanistan? <laughs> uh, we can try to do that. He says uh, he has been trolling the Internet for the last week looking for a notebook to replace his netbook. He's currently in Afghanistan, and uh, the Acer Aspire 1 just doesn't cut being his main everyday computer. The 120-gig hard drive won't even hold his whole iTunes library, hence why he had to bring an external drive along. In, uh, in his search for a good long-term replacement, swung by PC Perspective to look at some of the reviews and have, uh, uh, that we've done. That's when he found the MSI GT680R. Looks like the one. However... He's uncertain of the processor he wants to go with. There are lots of options ranging from 2.2 to 3.3 gigahertz. Uh, six, uh, well, let's see. There is a 2720QM versus the 2820QM. The difference being looks like 100 megahertz and 2 megs of cache for the higher end option there. Yeah, they're basically, they're both Core i7 processors. I mean, they're, they're both, <sighs> dude, you're running an Acer Aspire 1 <laughs> with a 120 gigabyte hard drive. <laughs> Um, I Both would say, like light. yeah, you know, the, you're talking about 180 bucks. Um, spend the 180 bucks on like, you know, extra hard drives or iTunes or or candy, um, because yeah. going to a Core i7 with six megabytes of, of L3 cache, um, you know, is is going to be so ridiculous. You, you're you're not going to care about the difference yeah. between that and and the one that costs 180 bucks more because. Going to that, the the twenty seven twenty QM is going to be so unbelievably fast compared to the netbook you've been using. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, so I, I I agree with Patrick there. He does ask, unfortunately, in the PS, uh, why is the GT six eighty R deactivated on Newegg already? And apparently, he, uh, Russell here has missed the news that all of the Sandy Bridge products that were for sale have been uh, canceled, delayed. And are being returned to the warehouse. So as much as a six, uh, the GT 680R might fit his needs, he's not going to be able to buy one, uh, at least until, say, March-ish. Late March would be a time for yeah. that. So um, I, I, at this point, I would say hold off. I wouldn't, I, even, even now, I wouldn't recommend buying something else 
with the Sandy Bridge notebooks like right around the corner. Although I guess right. I said that in December as well, but I didn't really foresee <laughs> the whole chipset problem. Um, but I still kind of hold by that recommendation. If you're looking for like, a, if he's looking for something to do gaming and virtual machines on, yeah, I mean, a higher performance notebook is going to work out best for him. You're going uh, to enjoy that so much. <laughs> finish off with a few quick Twitter questions. MD100 Play says two gigabyte GTX 460 or a one gigabyte GTX 460 running at 800 megahertz. Um, uh, more memory is always better. However, more memory is not really enough better to justify a price difference in my mind. I think the one gigabyte variant of the GTX 460 is uh, going to be, I mean, if they're the same price, obviously you get the two gig, but if we're talking about like a $30 difference, I'd still go with the one gig. I don't think you're going to see a big benefit from doubling that up. Brandon Weir says, I need to build a gaming PC for at Bulletstorm's 222 launch with Sandy Bridge boards getting yanked out. What is the best option now? Well, the only other option, unless you want to buy one of the <laughs> dual core systems, would be an AMD CPU. Um, well, you can still get Linfield uh, right. processors. I, I'm hesitant. I don't really want to recommend that necessarily uh, unless you can get like a really good deal on stuff because it is, you know, an EOL platform, right? You're not good right. in September, October, November, if you want to upgrade your process or something like that, you're not going to be able to, to do that. Um, with the AMD platforms, you do have that upgrade ability option going, going forward. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if it's something he wants to build it before the launch of this game, Bulletstorm, which by the way, probably the coolest name for a video game ever. <laughs> no, nothing gets right to the point quite like uh, Bulletstorm. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem recommending, you know, getting one of the AMD uh, six core Phenom 2 X6 processors. Yeah, the Phenom 2s are actually pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they're going to be cheap. I mean, AMD is, is taking, I, I think it was last week we kind of talked that I hoped that AMD would maybe make some, uh, some move in the field while Intel was kind of in, in a tight spot. And they are doing that. There's some advertisements running on, on various websites that, with the tagline uh, "ready, willing, and stable," so <laughs> you know that somebody somebody got the message. I think that the company and, and they've lowered some prices on on their processors at like Newegg and Tiger Direct and those guys. You know, definitely trying to to get as many new customers as they can in this thirty to sixty yeah. day period. So I mean, the I, and, AM and you can Oops, use an sorry. Nvidia and AMD GPU still. So I mean, right at that point. Yeah, I mean, AMD's top-of-the-line Phenom 2X6, 1100T, Thuban, 3.3 gigahertz, 3.7 gigahertz, turbo socket AM3, 125-watt, six-core desktop processor is selling for a whopping 240 bucks. Um, yep. You know, dropping down to a 3.2 uh, gigahertz, uh, 1090T Phenom 2, cuts you down to 200 bucks, and then, like, you just go right on down the line at $10 intervals for a while, 10 or $20 intervals. So... That's nice. cheap. Yeah, that's that's yep. that's a pretty good processor for a pretty good price. The Rack House says, with the Sandy Bridge issues, will this have an impact on the LGA 2011 CPUs? No. Yeah. No, I mean, th those weren't going to be out for, you know, months anyway, uh, right. probably after June or July. So, I mean, no, the, the chipsets that those were using aren't the same chipsets that have these problems. So... Uh, that's that's not going to be affected at all. I, I will suggest that they will probably significantly step up their in-house testing on the LGA 2011 <laughs> uh, chipsets okay. um, so as not to have another situation where uh, uh, one of Intel's partners finds a problem in their extensive abuse testing and comes to Intel, at which point Intel verifies it. So I, I think Intel, Intel has been known to overcompensate for its mistakes in the past. So yeah. I, I, would sus I would suspect that the LGA 2011 CPUs will have the most bomb-proof chipset that they can produce. They will be doing horrible, terrible, evil things to these chipsets to make sure that they don't have a failure like this. So... There you go. Um, At least I before, hope. We, <laughs> before we round out the show, we have uh, last week, I believe, Intel motherboard, the uh, Intel DP55WG LGA1155 motherboard. So no chipset, no recalls on this board, completely, completely ready to build a system around, uh, unopened, so you know I didn't go through it and uh, steal your SATA cables or something like that. Uh, the winner 
for this contest was David Albin, who I believe lives somewhere in the great state of Utah. So congratulations to David. Uh, thanks to my newfound idea of having the name, address, phone number in the email already. I already have all the nice. information. So this will go out tomorrow. We don't have to have any uh, elongated waits this time around. So uh, no new contest this week. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll give away the 9800 GTX eh? Eh? after uh, we finish all of our testing. It's like I a good collector. It's like a good precious. collector. Card, right? It'd be a nice one, dude. What's coming up on uh, PC Per this week? So I kind of Outside already of spilled the beans on the, this. The 9800 versus now. <laughs> the, the past versus the current uh, will definitely be a focus there. We have, ironically, had two more P67 motherboard reviews coming out. Um, wow. Those were the ones that were basically finished before this whole mess happened. So we're going to go ahead and publish all that type of information. Um, yeah, so that, that's... That's kind of roundabout. We, we posted a review of Corsair's entry into the speaker market. I think we posted that story up yesterday. So if you're interested in, in some new uh, 2.1 speaker solutions, they have some really cool kind of control panel, uh, LCD panel based control system on it. A little bit expensive at 250 bucks. But according to Josh, who wrote the article for us, pretty, you know, pretty high quality 2.1 audio solution. So you can check that out. And anything, nice. uh, what is new coming up on Techzilla? We have a really fun episode that just went up, uh, round up a sub $500 camcorders, and which they actually started like 150 bucks. Um, we have the Verizon versus AT&T face off on uh, signal strength in our studio. I'll give you a hint. Nice. One of them did much better than the other. Uh, Alex Lindsay's on. Uh, you may know him from MacBreak Weekly and, and the Pixel Core. Uh, talking about editing 3D video and uh, and we talk about the longevity of data on flash drives and put together a very nice backup uh, solution. I'll use the marketing term solution since that was in one of the emails today. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Thumb drives may, or depending on your point of view, thumb drives may or may not be much more long lasting than you thought they were. The answer may surprise you. Oh, and color lasers. <laughs> color lasers are cheap, dude. Nice color oh, yeah. lasers have gotten really cheap. Oh, yeah. You know what? I... I know when I bought one probably four years ago to print out media kits and stuff with, even then I thought, wow, these had come down a lot. Is toner yeah. still expensive though? Uh, well, one of the ones we talked about, there was a Dell printer we talked about. And I'm going to be a jerk and make you go to the show to find it. It is ridiculously <laughs> cheap. Um, less than a difficult night, considerably less than a hard night out in the bar. But they're looking at, it's still like three cents a page, three and a half cents a page for black and white versus about 18 cents a page for full color when you're looking at uh, eight by 10 yeah. pages. So it's it's still significantly more expensive to do color, uh, but that's still significantly less than you would pay for color going down to the local print shop, at least here True. in San Francisco. Yeah, um, same here. So, yeah, three cents a page versus like 60 cents a page plus computer rental time uh, at my local FedEx Kinko shop. Uh, you know, the, the, the upfront on the laser printer looks really good. So, and this is like with wireless built in and Ethernet built in and decent admin tools built in. Um, I'm actually really actually thinking about upgrading the computer in my house. Uh, see the computer, the, the printer in my house, which will probably horrify my wife. Look, honey, another printer. <laughs> yes, I know. Mine would do the same. <laughs> so I think, I think this one is, is done for. Yep. We we are, I, I think so. I think, I think, I think we've beat that horse. <laughs> Twitch at twit.tv is the email, assuming I can actually remember the email because I just dumped more Sudafed into my system. So if I look glazed, it's because I can breathe again. Uh, and, of course, PCPer.com is Ryan's home on the Internet. You can find me at techzilla, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A dot com. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.